motions. Be it resolved that Parliament, by affirmative resolution, approves the draft value added tax amendment of rate order which varies the rate specified under Section 10.1 of the Act. Honorable members, the question is that Parliament by affirmative resolution approves the draft value added tax amendment of rate order which varies the rate specified under section 10.1 of the act. Honorable Madam Speaker, We've brought this motion to the House, Madam Speaker, in order to be able to amend the VAT or VAT tax rate. As announced last night, Madam Speaker, in my address to the nation, that we have contemplated the VAT rate and have come to the conclusion at this particular juncture that we want to reduce the rate from 15% to 12.5%. In order to make this determination, Madam Speaker, we conducted several studies. The first study that we had conducted, Madam Speaker, was a diagnostic study done by the Caribbean Development Bank, led by the Caribbean Development Bank, which included the Eastern Caribbean Central Bank, which also included the World Bank and the IMF. Um, that report, Madam Speaker, was very, very informative in terms of the desires of the government. So clearly, in reading that, in preparing that report, Madam Speaker, we decided to address the situation head on and provide the CDB with an outline of what the overall objectives are for the government, Madam Speaker. It has long been believed by our government that the level of taxation in this country is too high. And that what in fact was happening was the amount of monies available in circulation was causing a further contraction of the economy. And that the policy or the idea of increasing VAT to 15% in a time of a recession further contracted and exasperated the situation. And we saw many small businesses, Madam Speaker, going out of business. I want to read an opening section of the report, Madam Speaker. It says, while VAT now accounts for 50% of the indirect taxes and 37.1% of all tax revenue. So of all the tax revenue we collect, VAT is 37%. And taxes as a revenue is 50% of the overall uh, form of taxation. Performance has been undermined by a paletta of exemptions and zero rating of goods. I bring this up because I remember in the campaign, Madam Speaker, I indicated that VAT is the most effective tax in collecting money. But a flaw in VAT is when we use it to be able to direct or implement a social program. And we're all tempted to reduce the VAT rate to zero or to exempt certain items from that being valuable. And so the report goes on and says that all tax revenue performance has been undermined by the plethora of exemptions and the zero rating of goods. One measure of that revenue, product, revenue productivity, the C coefficient ratio calculated in 2014 um, at around 0.36% suggested that there were inefficiencies in the system, inefficiencies, because of the number of exemptions that we had and how we had put together 
the VAT regime. The doors could be driven by, one, a policy gap where there are high number of exemptions or VAT is not applied on a single rate, or a compliance gap where VAT implementation is imperfective, in, in, imperfect, imperfect. With a ratio of 91% VAT, a compliance gap where VAT implementation is imperfect, where a ratio of 91% VAT compliance was found to be generally reasonable, although it has been declining gradually. So it means that we had a, a high amount of compliance to VAT when we first introduced it. But as VAT continued, the amount of compliance started to reduce, meaning that people found ways to get around the VAT net. And therefore, I don't think it's any secret that when you go to some stores that you're offered the choice of paying cash or in getting a receipt. <coughs> Approximately 71 headings under the harmonized system for the classification of goods were, were exempt, while there were an estimate 164 goods of zero-rated list. Some areas where there are may be scoped for closing loopholes, including zero rating exemption and some goods for consumption, both processed and unprocessed, the exemption of pharmaceuticals, including both prescription and over-the-counter medicines, from an environmental sustainability perspective, as well as the revenue of the zero rating of electricity services, could also be reviewed, and the treatment of water and sewage services, that in the presence of an, an efficient targeting mechanism, could also be reassessed. So in essence, what CDB is saying is that if you want to help people who cannot afford health care, then you must do it through a social program. Attempting to do this is only exempting everybody and it creates the flaw in the system. You know, very similarly, when we had, and both sides have made this mistake, where we had a subsidy on rice, flour, and sugar. Regardless of what stage you are, what income level you were, you benefited from the, um, from, the, from the subsidy. In fact, I have friends from Martinique who came here on a regular basis to be able to, write, to buy rice, flour, and sugar. The productive sector who uses any of those inputs in, this processing, in, in, its, in its processing were benefiting from those subsidies. So in essence, that's what CDB is saying about that. That when you make these exemptions to be able to target people that are in need, it creates a flaw in the VAT, and it's not recommended. So in moving forward, Madam Speaker, we chose at this time to reduce the rate to 2.5%. And if you will see that we have not changed any of the current exemptions. So by calculation, Madam Speaker, we're talking about that we would be injecting the tune of $52.5 million for one year back into the economy back into the hands of the productive sector, back into the hands of the households of individual people. In essence, trying to lower the cost of living. But I have to say to you, Madam Speaker, that the report also warns us that in small economies like ours, attempting to grow the economy only by increasing consumption could potentially dampen our growth rate, meaning that the multiplier that you need, the effect that you're expecting to get in your economy by just putting money back in and generating consumption could possibly not generate a growth in your economy. So therefore, putting money back in the economy by itself potentially will not result, result in any change. In fact, you must look to get foreign direct investment or investment in your country and grow your economy structurally combined with the reduction in the VAT rate to potentially allow your economy to be able to grow. I make reference, Madam Speaker, again to the report where it says, It is within the, this context that the tax reduction measures now being proposed by the government of St. Lucia in an effort to reduce the cost of living and spur economic activity have to be addressed. All the intention of the proposed policies is laudable. They could have a more comprehensive, they could have an unintended consequence of undermining 
the fiscal, the fiscal and debt sustainability in the absence of a more comprehensive approach to achieving these objectives. Notably, even if in an increase in the economic activity to work, occur as a result of the proposed policies, given the low fiscal multipliers for St. Lucia, it is not likely that such increases would be sufficient magnitude to compensate for the revenue loss. So in English, what the, what the, what the bank is saying is that if you reduce the level of taxation income, and, it, and with the intention of reducing the cost of living, making life a bit easier for people, and by putting money in people's pockets, it potentially, potentially, could actually, in fact, exasperate our fiscal situation because of the loss of revenue to government. So the $52 million loss of revenue. So that is why, Madam Speaker, we have deliberately introduced simultaneously to the drop in the VAT rate an increase in the airport departure tax. So we're going to be increasing the airport departure tax, Madam Speaker, by 73 US dollars from $25. And of that 73 US dollars, 35 US dollars will be going into the airport development uh, fund. So when we were in government previously and we were announcing the beginning of the airport, we thought there was wisdom in putting the tax in and start collecting money in order that we would have to borrow less money to build the airport. Unfortunately, the Prime Minister at the time felt that was immoral and that we should not be putting a tax on at that time because no work had commenced. The logic seemed to have failed him when it came to the dam. But nonetheless, we had collected $50 million up until the time that he made the change. And if, in fact, we had left that $35 on, we would have in excess of $200 million in the account today, Madam Speaker, which is half of the amount of money that we would have required to be able to build the airport, half. So that means instead of having to go out to borrow $400 million, we would only have to go out and borrow $200 million because we would already had $200 million in the account. So we are going to reintroduce that tax and put that money back into that account to start building the fund so that as the implementation of this tax comes on, it will reduce the burden of the taxpayers of this country to be able to have to pay for a new airport. We've also decided to take $30 of that tax, Madam Speaker, and put it into a sinking fund. Because in my estimation, in fact, if there is one thing that I find difficult to forgive the previous government of, is that when they came into government in 2011, there was in excess of $200 million in a sinking fund. Every year, each government would put in anywhere between five, six million to $12 million into a sinking fund. The purpose of that sinking fund was to build up a reserve of money that when bonds and treasury bills came due, that we had the ability to pay them off, pay off the principal, because all we've been paying is the interest. So we call that fiscal responsibility. But what did the government do? They spent the $200 million. Unencumbered money. Unencumbered money. Unencumbered money. $200 million. So what we're going to do now is put 30 US dollars of that tax back into the sinking fund. And when, and when we spoke to the World Bank and the IMF and the CDB, and we agreed with their conclusions, we said, look, we think that in the short term, we must bring relief to the people of St. Lucia. Because the former government's policies did not take into account the more vulnerable people in our society. Pensioners who are earning less pension than $1,000 a month, who had no way of making any extra money, a 66% hike in water, the introduction of that on their inputs, 
Where were they to get the money to pay for those things? But in the great humility of St. Lucian, they stayed silent. That is until June 6. The young people who realize that you cannot have one job in this country to be able to survive. Not one. People know that they have to have multiple jobs. The mother who is taking care of the household, when everybody goes to work and to school, where does she find herself? Vending. Or a little farm to grow some stuff and then send things down to be vending. Young men who had jobs, but knew that the, construct the construction jobs were not stable took their money to buy a small truck to find themselves in additional business. All of a sudden, the license fees were doubled and trebled in front of them. Many of them had to take those same trucks and park them and watch them. And every day, be angry at a government that seemed insensitive to what they were trying to accomplish. But they too, but they too, Madam Speaker, on June 6, we're ex able to express their frustration. And the list goes on, Madam Speaker. People who had no money to simply go to a hospital, pay for a, doctor, a doctor's visit. People who didn't have the money to buy a prescription. People who were suffering in silence. So what we have done, Madam Speaker, is reduce the 2.5% to bring some immediate relief to the public and to the businesses of this, of, this, of this economy, but covered ourselves by putting the $30 US into a sinking fund. If in fact that we are able to stimulate the growth in this economy by bringing some new investment, which we've been working hard at, combined with now this new relief in the economy, which hopefully can increase the consumption, Hopefully we see enough growth in the economy that we earn as much money taxation-wise with a lower rate. But if we don't, we are not going to jeopardize the vulnerability of this, of this economy. So we're reserving those monies in order to be able to make sure we can cover the shortfall. In addition to the prudent fiscal management an important element to ensuring fiscal and economic stability is unlocking the country's economic growth potential. At present, at present St. Lucia's growth potential, and I want you to listen to this. St. Lucia's growth potential is around 2%, which is inadequate to reduce the stubbornly high unemployment and raise, and, and raise the standard of living of its citizens. Unlocking growth will require a heavy emphasis on institutional reforms and strategically selected infrastructural expenditure. What does that mean? It means that they're seeing that as the economy is currently structured, if we were to continue down the path that the former government was going on, the most that this economy could grow is 2%. And that that 2% rate is inadequate to cover the increases in debt and to be able to provide the standard of living that we all want, that we also deservingly, we richly deserve. That is what we should be focusing on. But the government was too concerned about macro account numbers. Fooling people. How do I know that? The report says... There are two numbers that we must focus on. First of all, is there extra tax money to be collected? They said we, if we can improve our efficiencies, maybe we can collect some more money. They said there's about a hundred million dollar shortfall. But the fact is that when we measure tax revenue as a percentage of the GDP, St. Lucia ranks at the same level of the developed countries of the world, meaning England, and Germany and the United States of America. We're collecting about 25% taxes to GDP. 24.5%. <laughs> and the rest of the Caribbean is at 21%.
The second thing that was interesting in the report is that when you measure how we were spending the money, that St. Lucia ranks the lowest, meaning we were spending some of the highest amount of money in public sector investment, and we were getting the lowest rate of return. So we were making all these sacrifices, NICE and STEP, and the CDP program, and running around. That's what I'm saying to you, fooling the people of St. Lucia, because those investments were not improving the capacity of the country to grow. That is the reality. That is the reality, and the numbers are there to speak for itself. Three years of economic contraction, and come here and talk about 1.3% growth, when for three years we declined. What about talking about leaving the country better than you found it? It's okay to criticize the former government, but leave it better than you found it. And then those words resonate more with people. But in fact, you all left it worse than it was before. Some reforms which government solutions should consider include exploring the linking of wage increase to productivity in the public sector, raising labor productivity by enhancing private sector participation in curriculum development to address the current skills and mismatches. You know, I remember when a very uh, well-respected political leader, Prime Minister Owen Arthur, came and spoke on their platform. But they were focused on what Owen was saying about me wanting to reduce VAT. And here we are reducing VAT. But Owen also said to them, what? It is unexcusable that a government would not recognize that the unemployment rate that you have is intrinsically linked to the deficiency of the education system and doing nothing to address it. That's him. The people were over there on the other side celebrating, saying, oh, he's telling Shastny he can't increase, he can't reduce that. As if you're celebrating the fact that people should not get a benefit. Reducing energy costs and improving energy security by utilizing concessional resources and exploring the opportunities for public-private partnerships in the area of renewable energy. I'm very happy to see the inroads that the former government was making. I think we were moving in the right direction. I'm also very happy that the World Bank intervened in Grenada. And a similar contract that is here in St. Lucia, the World Bank participated in breaking that contract, that monopoly. And remember, when the Dominica government broke Cayman Wireless's monopoly, how we saw a change in communications. I believe that changing that contract in Grenada will have similar repercussions throughout this region because the cost of energy is too high. One, our dependence on outside resources, meaning energy from the outside the world, in which the prices continue to fluctuate between $150 all the way down to $46 leaves us in a vulnerable state. And we must find a way to bring some stability to that. And clearly, harnessing green energy is a critical area. So I applaud the former government in moving and continuing in the direction we were going in, but unfortunately, it didn't go far enough. And where you've left it is where we will take it and make sure we introduce now green energy in order to reduce our vulnerability allow us to meet our SDG goals that we've set, but more importantly, bring price stability to our energy sector and to be able to make sure that we're reducing the, the cost of energy over a period of time. And what we have to continue to depend on, and that's where Minister of Sustainability and the idea of also having her be the Minister of Innovation is critical. It is the dependence that the innovation that's taking place in solar and windmills and other forms of energy continues to improve, one, in the efficiency, which means that the cost of that electricity rate will continue to come down. And because it's from the sun or it's from the wind, which are, which are elements that are in our, our hemisphere, the likelihood is that we're going to see stability in energy cost. Energy costs are important not only to the cost of living of solutions and our uh, foreign ex exchange, but also more importantly, in making us more competitive. We cannot be competitive when we're paying 36 to 38 cents or 40 cents US a kilowatt hour for electricity. 
encouraging stakeholder participation on national and sectoral issue, improving business facilitation by addressing the institutional efficiencies, particularly in those agencies that interface directly with the private sector, finalizing enacting insolvency legislation, and removing the barriers that inhibit the process of registering property. This is a very vexing issue, Madam Speaker. It's a very troublesome one. Because of our Napoleonic, our French history, we have a Napoleonic Code, which has enshrined certain laws when it comes to um, foreclosures. And sometimes we only look at this thing from one side. We look at it from the person paying money and, and, and paying a mortgage, finding themselves with an inability to pay, and then losing that house. But if you don't address that situation, and we address it in a very socially conscionable way, if you don't address that situation, we now find ourselves where, on average in this region, that the banks are holding non-performing portfolios of in excess of 17%, meaning that 17% of the loans that they have are not performing. The prudent level is five, and even at 5%, all kinds of bells and whistles should be going off. So it means that what we're going to do if we don't resolve this problem, Madam Speaker, is we're going to undermine the savings of people who have their money in banks. Because in essence, we're making the banks insolvent. And so while we must be very sensitive as to how we deal with this moving forward, because owning your own home is such an emotional and such an important part of being St. Lucia and building a life for yourself and your family, but we must be cognizant that we do have responsibilities. And we must not undermine the ability and the, the reliability of our financial institutions. In light of the preceding discussion, the government of St. Louis should, should, should seek to review the system of taxation with the aim of enhancing efficiency, equity, and transparency. Closing revenue leakages in the major tax categories such as VAT, PIT and corporate tax should be an imperative, particularly in light of proposed policy solutions. This would ensure, among other things, the more equitable use of deductions allowances, addition to use of cabinet concessions to incentive, incentivize private sector activity, and especially where these dis decisions are not made publicly available, should be limited. And it does, it does to not promote transparency or ensure predictability. In this regard, the government solutions should consider the use of omnibus, omnibus legislation to cover the range of concessions across various sectors. And in the event that a cabinet conclusion is required, the publishing of these decisions. Lastly, the government solutions should seek the conduct and publish annual tax expenditure reports to better engage the, in the cost-benefit analysis of incentives. On that matter, Madam Speaker, we went through a lot of discussions because the report also indicates that the productive sectors of this country, which have an opportunity for growth, all have one thing in common. They're export-led. So there's this conflict with regards to giving incentives and to what, it, to what effect does it make those businesses more competitive? Because if you don't give those incentives and your businesses are not competitive, they're not going to grow. And therefore, the rationale of what we like to call foregone revenue is not necessary. So the question becomes, how do we make that happen? And the Minister of Tourism alluded to it, that we're in the process of reviewing all of our incentives not just in tourism, but in our culture, in manufacturing, and in industry. And that there is going to be a core commonality in those incentives because they're all export-led. So the premise that applies to manufacturing or to our banana sector also applies to tourism and our financial services. There has to be that consistency. We must be looking to generate growth, and that growth has to come in the international market. There's not enough of economy, this, the size of the economy here isn't big enough by itself to generate the necessary growth that we have to have. So we have to be competitive. And in being competitive, there are things that we have to overcome. I was seeing a report that the cost of a container to come here is 
to go to Antigua's 1800, to go to Jamaica's nine. The cost of electricity in Trinidad is 10 cents. Here it's 36 cents. So it's, it's, it's four times, 400% higher here than it is in Trinidad. Cost of labor. We think the cost of labor is low here, but relative to Mexico and the Dominican Republic and parts of Asia, we are high. So these are the things that we must address. We must be able to determine how we're going to be competitive. I bring all this up, Madam Speaker, because the report is all-encompassing. We are engaged with the private sector, with the unions, with international agencies, with the intent that by April that we will be announcing a comprehensive four-year strategic plan. One that recognizes we cannot continue doing business as usual. One that starts recognizing that there are changes that we have to make. Public service reform, it can't just be a catchphrase. The idea that you're going to curtail wages by stifling increases in the wages is not a solution. How can it be expected that you're going to keep wages down for 10 years and give zero, 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 zero? That is when I say that you're passing on the burden of our society to the wrong people. We must find a mechanism in which we can grow this economy and not at the expense of the workers of this country. Everybody deserves better. And as I said in my UN speech, any policy that takes away from the basic human rights of education, of health care, of justice and security, and your quality of life, that policy cannot be accepted. Not for a short time, not for a medium time, and certainly not for the long term. We must be willing to make those tough decisions. In order to recognize, to grow, we must be competitive. And let us make those decisions collectively. That is why, Madam Speaker, this 2.5% was designed to be part of five to stay alive. Five to stay alive is not the economic solution or panacea for solutions. Five to stay alive recognize that too many people in our society who could not afford to protect themselves, who were not affording a basic living, were being affected by the policies, and too much of a burden was being put on them. That is why the vehicle license fee became effective on September 1st, a 50% reduction in the increase that they imposed. In this school year, we will, increase, we will increase the school bus subsidy and expand the school feeding program. Property taxes, we all should pay property taxes. But the system of imposing property taxes based on the value of your land. Well, you know what? If I want to borrow money, I know who to go and value my land. If I want to sell my property, I know who to go and value my land. If I want to pay taxes, that's not the same person that's going to value my land. And unfortunately in St. Lucia, we have the choice. So valuation of land is not the appropriate way in this economy to be able to assess the property taxes. So we have to find a new system. So while we're finding that system, this government has seen it fit to make sure that the money stays in the pockets of the people who could not be affording at this point to pay the property taxes. And even though many of the people were not paying the property tax, they are good, conscionable people. They are Catholic people. And guess what? They went to sleep at night feeling guilty they were not paying those taxes. The Ministry of Finance is working with the Ministry of Health on the proposed target amnesty on health care, which will begin on the 1st of December. Pensioners who are making less than $1,000 a month. People who are unemployed and who are already on the poverty list should not have to pay for health care. And they should not have the burden of going and feeling guilty about going to the hospital knowing that they owe money or terrified to go and see a doctor or terrified to go and get a prescription. Until we get the health care system, we cannot continue to allow them to carry the burden. And I'm very, very happy to say that the dialysis takes a very special part in that. So dialysis patients who 
are not insured, the government will help them because they should not go knowing that they're going to die if they don't get dialysis. And last but not least, that we've put in a reduction of 2.5%. We've done the prudent thing and put together money set aside in case we lose money, in order that we don't jeopardize the fiscal viability of this country. But in the meanwhile, we're working with Ernst & Young. I have to say, I've got my first draft report from them that by the end of December, that we will now put together a reviewed program for VAT and create a VAT system that we believe that is going to serve all masters, that is not going to be designed to cause anybody in our society to be overburdened, but one that also recognizes that we must be competitive and our tax structure cannot uh, cause us to be uncompetitive on a global basis, but at the same time fulfills our obligations. And that tax structure will come with a review structure. What's the review structure? Healthcare. If I had not seen it for myself, Madam Speaker, I would not believe it. That you come into government, that you have two new hospitals with no solutions on the table. Even trying to find out, Madam Speaker, how much money the new hospital is going to cost us. We just saw a report, preliminary estimates is that there's going to be an $80 million increase in recurrent expenditure just for the Owen King Hospital. That means an over an 80% increase in recurrent expenditure in healthcare by itself. Where's that money gonna come from? And Madam Speaker, we have not even begun to talk about St. Jude, a project that started off at $19 million, $30 million. Now we're at $91 million. Potentially buildings will have to be broken down because there was no plan not even being built to standard. And the cost, the idea of where we were going to get the recurrent expenditure to pay for it, there was nothing there. The same thing with the judicial system. 4,500 case backlog, no DPP. 400, four, four people in the DPP's office, it should have been 10. Where are we going? How are we going to resolve these issues? A police force that is demoralized. You have a situation in which you have no forensic lab. We're having to send out things to Bermuda and to Barbados, and we're even behind on those payments. So that is undermining the judicial system that we have, because we have to. basic common sense tells you, if in fact we can convict people quicker, it will be a deterrent for people to be getting involved in crime. But almost we're giving people a license to commit crime in this country. We had a former government that just seemed to ignore those basic issues, Madam President. So there has to be an overall change. We talk about education, how much money we're spending on education and how much of that money goes just in salaries. So Madam Speaker, I don't want in any way for anybody to believe for one moment that the 2.5% VAT reduction is the panacea. This is not the solution to our problems. This 2.5% relief is to recognize in a conscientious, conscionable way the pain and the suffering certain people have had in this society. And that we will design a social program that will be targeted. The ability to select the people who need help and to make sure that we're working with them. You know, when I hear about footpaths and I hear about improving the sewage in, in certain communities, yes, that improves the quality of life of a poor person, but it doesn't take them out of poverty. The focus of this government will be to take people out of poverty. And we shall empower the people of this country. That is why one of the things we're commissioning right away, and I'm so happy that the students are here from Sir Arthur Lewis College. Mind you, they are law students, and I congratulate all of you. But we want to implement a new recording studio and also a film studio as well as a broadcasting studio, and that we put it into Sir Arthur Lewis's curriculum. Because when we talk about the creative industries, it's not about the ability who puts on the best concert. It's about allowing our young people to participate in the creative industries. And when I had the opportunity to speak to each one of you, I said to you, entertainment law, it's global. Entertainment law is based on what? It's based on an idea. It's based on innovation. 
And the great thing about an idea and innovation, it has no borders. The people who invented Uber are two students who created something in today's world that was just common sense and have become incredibly wealthy by creating an idea and being able to follow up on it. And I encourage all the young people to follow in the footsteps of the people in this country who have been successful. People who have taken on the world intellectually, Sir Arthur Lewis and Derek Walcott. If they can do it, why not you? So Madam Speaker, I rest at this moment only to say that this government is acting in a prudent fashion. I'm hoping that people will enjoy the, the benefits of the 2.5% decline, that the increase in the airport tax we believe will have no impact on the tourism arrivals to this country because we're charging what other people are also charging. It doesn't make us any more or less uh, competitive than anybody else. And that we're going to reserve that money and hopefully we are right and we see growth in our economy, we see continued growth in the revenue of this country at a lower tax basis and the money that we're generating will go in to help improve healthcare, education and your future. I thank you very much.